When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, With evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring that they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. 
and the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day, about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague upon the people, because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. Now, is there a trick to this? If someone knows? Yeah, good. Just very tentative about these things. <laughs> uh, friends, I can't tell you how good it is to be with you uh, today. Um, I remember when the first City on a Hill was planted, I was consulted about that one. And to see them multiply is great. And to see them go into state is great. But to see you is terrific. Um, so it's great to be here. I've known Andrew for quite some years now and uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Let's pray. Almighty God and loving Father, may the words I speak now be your words. May you graft them into our hearts and work in us so as to bring forth in us the fruit of good works. We pray this for the honour and praise of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now friends, I want to begin today's talk uh, by letting you into a secret. You see, these chapters of the Bible that we're looking at today and next week are very special to me. These passages are high on the list of passages from the Bible that have shaped my life in a very personal way. Um, these passages we're going to look at have been incredibly formative in my understanding of who God is and what God is like. They have shaped my understanding of how God relates to us, his people, and how we relate to him. And so my hope is that as we look at these chapters, then we will, they will similarly transform your understanding of God. I'm hoping that your love for him and his son will deepen. And with that said, let's get underway. And I want to do this by introducing you to, this is, a very, this is an unusual introduction for me, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to introduce you to a philosophical term. The philosophical term is theism. In the world of uh, Christian philosophy and theology, the term theism is used in a couple of ways. Uh, it's used to refer to belief in God. You are a theist if you believe in God. Second is used to describe a systematic and philosophical system that is sort of an interlinking between Christian theology and Greek philosophy. In other words, it's the term you use for a particular set of beliefs and ideas formed by the marriage of Jewish and Christian thought. Um, a well-known English scholar, Jim Packer, who you may have heard of, defines theism using 10 characteristic beliefs. Here they are. A theist believes that God is personal and triune. God is self-existent and self-sufficient. God is simple, perfect, and unchangeable. God is infinite, incorporeal, many, uh, measureless, omniscient, and eternal. If you don't understand some of those terms, it doesn't matter. You can hear a philosopher and theologian speaking, can't you? In other words, he's not bound by the limitations of time and space that apply to us. He's always present everywhere. He knows all, all the time. But there's more to theism than that. Theism also says that God is purposeful. 
and omnipotent. That is, he's in control of all things. That is, he has a plan for the history of the universe he made, and he carried it out by man- he carries it out by managing, controlling, and governing everything. In other words, he's distinct from his world. He does not need the world. He's above the grasp of being um, known thoroughly. You cannot know all that there is to know about him. He sustains the world, shapes the world, serves, steers the world in a way that accomplishes what he wants. God is, now here's the technical term, impassable, which means no one can inflict suffering, pain or any sort of distress on him. God is love. God has a love for his creation, for the world, for all humans, for all creatures. Next, God's ways with humankind as set forth in the scriptures show him to be both awesome and adorable. Why? Because he's truthful, faithful, gracious, merciful, just, patient, constant, wise, just, good and generous. Next, theism says God uses the gift of human language to tell us things directly through the word of his spokespeople, prophets and apostles and preachers and, and the Lord Jesus in particular. Now, lots of songs celebrate this. Here is a famous one by Faber. It goes like this. See if you can understand it. My God, how wonderful you are. Your majesty, how bright. How beautiful is your mercy seat. Your majesty, how bright. How wonderful, how beautiful the sight of you must be. Your endless wisdom, boundless power and awful purity. And so he goes on. Then he reaches a crescendo with these words. And some of you may even know these words, especially some of the older ones among you. No earthly father loves like thee. No mother ever so mild. Bears and forbears as thou hast done with me, thy sinful child. Now, many people think, you might have wondered why I start this way. I start this way for a reason and you'll see as we go on. Many of you think there's one particular verse in Scripture that might affirm the key elements of theism. It is a verse you'll probably spend a bit of time on already in one of the sermons in Exodus. Do you remember what that verse is and what that statement is? It's in Exodus 3 verse 14. It is when God meets Moses at the burning bush. Do you remember that occasion? Do you remember what God says to Moses? He tells Moses his name. It is the Lord... And then he explains what the name means. I am who I am. Today, I want us to see how theism stands up by what we see in another book, part of the book of Exodus. And that place, our passage for today. So come with me and let's have a look at it. There's so much good and exciting stuff in this story and we're just going to skim through it. But I want to do that so that we can get at the heart of it. We're going to learn great things about the true and living God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, have your Bibles open. Now, as always, when you're interpreting the Bible, trying to understand it, it's important to remember context. So let's just set the the big context. Do you remember where we are in Exodus? God's people were in Egypt. They were slaves under cruel overlords. They cried out to God and God heard their prayer. He delivered them out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses. He gave them his law. He ratified a covenant with them. He gave them various laws as part of that covenant. Then in chapters just before our chapters, he gave Moses instructions about the tabernacle. In other words, he gave Moses instructions about how God would make himself available. The God of all eternal time and space would make himself available to this people in this place. He gave them instructions about the tabernacle. So he told his people, this is how you can avail yourself of my presence. He told his people how they could avail themselves of his grace. But while Moses is up on the mountain, the people remain at the bottom. And that's where we are in this chapter we're looking at now. Moses, the granddad, as it were, of the whole thing, up in the mountain with God and the people down below. Let's take a look at what happens. In verse 1, we're told Moses is delayed. And then the people gather themselves together. The phrase has a, always in uh, the Bible, has a menacing tone to it. So we listen carefully, curiously, 
apprehensively to their request and it's straightforward. Can you see it there? In verse 1, the request is straightforward. Up, make us gods for who shall go before us. As for this Moses, they say, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. 32.1. The Israelites were used to having Moses as their mediator. However, they're fed up now with his absence. That's implied in the disrespectful language. Can you see it there? As for Moses, this man, it seems to say they feel Moses has abandoned them. And Aaron... God's appointed priest instructs them as to what they should do. Take off your rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. In all likelihood, the rings of gold being referred to are the items that the Israelites were given by their neighbours when they left Egypt. Do you remember that? Elsewhere in the Bible, earrings are associated with foreign gods. In other words, it's possible that the earrings are not just pieces of jewellery, but items associated with the worship of gods other than the Lord. In any case, they take the rings and they bring them to Aaron. And he shapes them into some sort of image in verse 4. An image that apparently looks like a young ox or bull. Throughout the ancient Near East, the bull was a symbol of lordship, leadership, strength, vital energy and fertility. But the bull was also deified and worshipped. At times it actually served as a sort of pedestal on which the gods stood. Right, so you formed this calf, as it were, this bull, and you said, oh, the God, the God, our God, stands upon that. That's probably, I think, what's going on here. Aaron has fashioned a bull and a pedestal upon it, which, will, which the invisible God of Israel has imagined as standing on. In other words, they are still worshipping, I think, Yahweh, the Lord, but they want a visible symbol of him. And when the image is finished, the leaders of this plan announce to all the people this thing. They say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, we don't, we're not sure why the plural gods is used, but the calf represented the gods or their god, And I want you to hear this. Soak it in. We don't quite understand this, but this is shocking in the extreme. They are turning against everything that has happened to them. They are taking the words of the God who said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. They are ascribing them to this newly fashioned God, imagined sitting on top of this calf, that they're made out of their own imagination. This is false worship. But that's not all. Let's tur- they also turn some sacred institutions upon their head. The Passover meal, do you remember it? It was a sacred remembrance of God's rescue of them from Egypt. It was followed by a meal on the mountain in the presence of God. Now, what it's done, what, what they do to it is it turn it into a wild party of excessive eating, drinking, and playing. Look at the last part of verse 6. They sat down to eat and rose to play. That has connotations of orgiastic and sexual activity. Can you see what's happening? This is awful. Aaron disappears from the scene and the rabble then takes over. That brings us to verse 7. We flip back to the top of the mountain and the Lord says to Moses these words. Go down. For your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now I wonder if you can hear what's going on here. Throughout Exodus, God has referred to the Israelites as my people. Did you notice the tone of phrase here? The rescue is one he has done, but the language of my people is now gone. They are your people. Look at it, verse 9. The Lord says, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. In verse 1, the people of Israel referred disrespectfully to God as this Moses. 
Now God uses this language, the same language, to refer to his people. Do you hear what he calls them? They are this people. And this people is what? Stiff-necked, which is frequent Old Testament image of willful obstinacy. Then in verse 10, God draws his statement to a conclusion. Look at it there, verse 10. That now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn against them and that I might consume them in order that I might make a great nation out of you. The Israelites had sought to turn around what God had done for them. The Lord seeks to turn back the clock. Everything he had done for them was because of his love for them and because he remembered his covenant that he had made through their forefathers. Do you remember Genesis 12? God promised to make Abraham's children a great nation. Do you remember that? In Exodus, he had fulfilled it by multiplying them in number and by rescuing them from the world power of the day. But now in frustration, he seeks to turn aside and to make Moses a great nation. In effect, he's seeking to turn back the promises to Abraham. Can you hear this? This is incredible stuff when you read it and understand it. And he, Abraham and his descendants and to make Moses a great nation instead. God is expressing extreme frustration and his desire to start again. And at this point, Moses steps in. Throughout the book, he's been a somewhat reluctant mediator between God and Israel. He's often been a bit self-centered, I think, in his approach. But now he turns willingly to the task and he puts the destiny of Israel at the forefront. He demonstrates that in the process of the rescue of, from Egypt of these people, he has in some, they have in some sense become his people. And so he pleads for the people with God. He implores God not to follow through with what he's expressed. Look at it. Have a look at the words again, verse 11. O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against this people, your people whom you have brought? Do you notice he's saying your, your people? Out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth? Turn again from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, now can you hear it? Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I promised I'll give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. Can you hear what he's doing? He's saying, you, you made promises. These are them. These are the fruit of those promises. It's an amazing speech. First, he's not letting God get away with distancing himself from his people. The Israelites are not the people of Moses. No, they are your people whom you brought up out of Egypt. What's more, the events of the Exodus were designed to bring glory to God among the nations. That glory will be under a huge hout if, uh, 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 cloud if the Israelites are destroyed. And most of all, Moses will not allow God to not be God. After all, what had God been about in the Exodus? Keeping his word, keeping his promises to Abraham and the other patriarchs. And what Moses is saying is if you ditch this at this point, you will not be keeping your promises to Abraham, Isaac and Israel to whom you swore an oath. Implied in all of this language, this is remarkable stuff, isn't it, when you read it, in, behind all of, the, all of this language, there is a challenge to God to be who, God, who Moses knows he is. He's not to be like an impotent calf. <laughs> He's to be the God of all the earth. And then comes the central request for, for, to God, the request to do what only a true God can do. Moses challenges God to turn from his fierce anger and to act according to grace and mercy, which is his nature. He urges him to relent. Do you know what relent means? Change mind. Turn around from going one way to another way. And look at God's response, verse 14. And the Lord did what? He relented from sending disaster, the disaster that he'd spoken of bringing. 
Sisters and brothers in Christ, we must not tone down these verses here. In verse 10, God is not pretending he will destroy the nation. He's not playing. He does intend to judge. And so we must not tone down also verse 14. To relent means exactly what it says, to change your mind, to turn back from going one direction to going the other direction. Moses has presented his argument to to God, he's pleaded with God, and he has been able to get God to alter his plans. He's convinced God to change his mind. Now he will not destroy his people, who he had every right to destroy because of their sinfulness. The rest of the chapter is straightforward. Just we'll skim through it. He returns to the camp. Moses returns to the camp, verse 15, sees what God had seen, verses 16 to 18, and like God, he's enraged. In verse 19, he deliberately breaks the stone tablets that represent the contract made, that is the agreement, the, the, the relationship, if you like, the covenant relationship between God and his people. Because they had broken it, he expresses it physically. It's a, it's a demonstration. Symbolically, he indicates that that covenant relationship between God and Israel had been broken by Israel. And God is well within his rights to walk away. Moses quizzes Aaron, verse 21. He receives an unsatisfactory and somewhat fudged report from Aaron about what has gone on. Finally, order is restored through devout Levites taking a drastic action of executing judgment in verse 28. 3,000 men are killed in that day. And then in verse 30 to 35, Moses intercedes again for the people of God. Conscious of the enormity of their sin, he seeks to make atonement, verse 31. And his request is refused. God declares that each individual will, will bear the punishment of his or her own sin. But then, as if to underscore the point that Moses had gained in pleading with God, the Lord says this. But now go. Lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel will go before you. Nevertheless, on the day when I visit, I will visit their sin on them. Then in chapter 33, verses 1 to 7, the Lord tells Moses that he'll not go up to the land of promise with them. The risk is that if he did, he would consume them on the way. Now, what I've done for you today, for us today, is to tell you part one of a two-part story. Let me tell you, it is dark, isn't it? It's a hard, tough story. Next week, come back because I will tell you the most glorious story. The next chapter is absolutely brilliant because it shows us something about God that, for me, undergirds everything that God does afterwards. But for the rest of the talk today, I just want to reflect on what we've learnt here and its implications. What I'm going to do is spend some time thinking about the exercise of theology. Um, You see, traditionally, Christian thinkers have divided the study of theology into a number of disciplines, and one of those disciplines is called systematic theology or doctrine. It's where people read the Bible and attempt to systematise everything that they find in the Bible. So they gather information all through the Bible to say, what does God have to say about this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing? Now, I think it's important to gather whatever information we can and do that exercise. But I need to say this, that systematic theology also has some inherent dangers. You see, its fundamental idea is to fit everything into a system. However, unfortunately, not everything fits neatly into systems. As you know, even within the Bible, there are hints that we need to be careful with developing neat systems. Such systems cannot always take everything into account. With that in mind, I want to go back to where we started today. Do you remember I gave you a systematic definition of theism? The risk with theism is that you get the impression that God has everything planned out to the minutest detail. He's committed to the plan as a whole. He's committed to the plan in its fine detail and he won't change his mind on it. There will be no variation. Moreover, the impression you can get with God with this rigorous, systematised 
collection is that God's not subject to any emotions or feelings. But the plain meaning of this text we have read today is what? Well, it, it raises questions about what I've just said. Yes, much of Scripture presents God as sovereign and in control of his world. And that's right. But passages such as this one say, don't go further than God himself goes. Don't go further than God himself goes. You see, even though he's sovereign, he's open to influence. Even though he knows all things, he is open to interaction. He can be argued with. He can and does change his mind. He can regret past actions. And he can become frustrated with his people. All of those things are also true. So I want to have both end. Can you see that? Our God is not the God of the philosophers. He's the God we see in Scripture, even in these passages here. He's hardly the distant, unmoved mover. No, he's present, hearing, involved, active and caring. And as we'll see next week, he's the God whose most common characteristic is to be overwhelmingly forgiving and merciful. And this is a great comfort if you sitting here today are his person. A great, great, great comfort, isn't it? You see, if, if that's your God, you can talk to him, can't you? <laughs> you can confide in him. You can cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. This is a God to whom you can run to. This is a God to know and love. And that's my first point. And in this coming week, I want you to take your concerns to him. Be bold with him. Talk to him. Plead with him. Glory in him and praise him. Our God is none like any of the other so-called gods of this world. The second point I want to make has to do with the effect that Moses has on God. You see, as I read through scripture, through the Old Testament in particular, I notice that the people of God often think that God will leave them. They know they have deserved judgment but they receive mercy and surprising love. And we know it too. You see, I think there's a, an Israelite disposition in all of us. A tendency to forget God is a God of great mercy. A disposition to turn God's grace on its head. A temperament of sinfulness and rebellion. But we know that God commits himself to be faithful to us even when we are faithless. Though we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself, as scripture says. We know God commits himself to be faithful to us even though we are faithless. We know that in Jesus Christ, God comes and says to us, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So in this coming week, do you know what I want you to do? I want you to thank God for Jesus. Thank God that he is yes and amen to all his promises. To all the promises of God. And that brings me to my last point for today. Do you remember that last section of the chapter when Moses attempted to make atonement for the people? He asked if he might be blotted out of God's book for the sake of the people. Do you remember that section? As it happened, God did not allow the exchange. But the attempt was a right attempt. <laughs> it was a right thing to do. 
He had it right. Sin was sin. Sin deserves punishment. But perhaps sin might be able to be atoned for by someone not involved in the sin. You can see where we're going. He had it right, didn't he? (laughs) Moses had it right. He knew what God had to be like. Someone who was without sin, not with the crowd, could perhaps take the punishment that was deserved by the sinner. Moses had a very good idea. And he gives us a very precious insight. And his inclination proved to be entirely correct. It was endorsed by God much later in history, as you know. And if you're a Christian here today, you know that in Jesus Christ, God allowed one man to take the sin of all sinful people who come and grasp it. What Moses was not able to do in this passage here, the perfect, sinless man, Jesus Christ, was able to do. And that means... Friends, we don't have to face the punishment ourselves. If we believe in him and what he did, we can be forgiven. That's the first part of our story. You can see there's great things to learn. You you might read this passage and think, well, what's there? What's going on? But there are enormously good and great things to learn. So make sure you're here, though, for next week's instalment. You see, we've only scratched the surface this week. And if you think it's been interesting and grand here... Wait for next week. Read ahead, see if you can spot it. Next week we get to the core of the matter. Next week I'm going to take you, as I said, to one of my favourite passages in Scripture and my favourite verses. Why don't you read ahead, see if you can spot them. Oh, and a final reminder. In this coming week, learn from Moses. Approach God boldly in prayer this week. Take all your concerns to him. Be bold with him. Talk with him. Plead with him. Glory in him. Thank him and praise him. For our God is greater than any other so-called God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are the one true God. And we thank you that we can worship you here today and serve you during the week and know that you are this God. Please help us to do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.